Well, I can tell you, uh, for one thing, he's definitely been uh, a champion for us for uh, fiscal responsibility on the school board. So uh, I'm going to just go ahead and bring Bill up and let him start talking to you. Thank you. but I'm going to drift a little bit. And I'd like to commend Marie for putting in the Facebook out. You can obviously see that here again. Oh, yeah, it worked well. <laughs> so, so I'm just, I'm here tonight. Next week is going to be an opportunity for you to hear substantive differences between the different candidates. For and, and what bothers me is that in this election cycle, that's going to be pretty much all there's going to be in August. And so... It affects 25% of the gross population, or actually stakeholders in the school system. And so I'm thinking it's going to be a really low turnout. And so we really need to, to bolster those of you that appreciate that we need quality education, and that needs to be at a price we can afford. So I want to give some just some basic facts about uh, the school system. Tonight, I'm not a candidate. This is Bill Nevada School Board member, because I'm going to take a minute to speak to you um, also as a friend. So here is this year's FEFD formula. This is how, how Lake County and all other counties get funded. And I presented this before, but this is the updated version. The good news is that Lake County is no longer 65th out of 67 counties in funding. <laughs> the, the bad news is we're 64th out of 67 <laughs> counties in funding. Now, on the other side, and this data is available, and I assimilated this from various sources, but it gives, for me, I needed something on a spreadsheet that I look back and look at the numbers. And that was really prompted by Van Schoken when I first ran uh, two years ago, which is the main responsibility of a board member is to understand the budget and understand the funding. And this is where our funding comes from. Areas that I attacked when I first came into office was transportation and our ESC and we have narrowed that gap. Uh, so I'm pretty proud of that. The reality is now, and this is also great news that never gets published, on this page is our outcome. You hear about this A, B, C, D school rating? Sure. Keep in mind 65th, or actually 64. And outcome, which I'm gonna leave these up here, which is over here, our points that determine their grade, we're 24th in the state. 24th. So that's money well spent. I'm just telling you that when people talk about that things aren't good about Lake County, that isn't truthful. And we are squeezing every dime out of every dollar. Updates on our Engage LCS. Um, does everybody know what Engage LCS is? No, go ahead and okay. explain it briefly. Engage, Engage LCS. And again, for those that don't know, I've been on the board for two years. It came, this is a grant that was, um, it's, it was an $800,000 grant, and it was for our school district to look at itself like it's a business. I had campaigned two years ago that our administrative salaries were too high, and to this day I call for a 10% cut. The consultants right off the bat said, your administrators are paid too much. <laughs> <laughs> 53 cent of every dollar we spend goes into the classroom. That is ridiculous. There is no charity that I would give to that that's all that went for its sole purpose, which is to educate children. So your board, existing board, committed over the next three years $30 million that would be redeployed, not raising taxes, but we would be redeployed back into the classroom. This budget session we are, that we're about to approve, $10.1 million is going to go back in the classroom. And that is looking at efficiencies and, in some cases, obviously cuts. Um, but I'll give you an example. We are looking at combining bell schedules. This is now this is going to be our $10 million next year, not this year. But next year, we'll save $4.1 million by changing our bell schedules and combining busing, buses. Um, that I'm still looking at $3.1 million in administrative cuts. Um, that's a slow one. <laughs> I've gotten 75000 so far. Um, but, but being fair, the superintendent listened, and it, 
it used to be if you became an assistant principal, you went from a teacher, let's say 30,000, 37,000, you went instantly to 60,000 as an AP. And there was no step. At the last two budget meetings ago, the superintendent introduced a matrix where now there will be a starting pay and you will get merit pay as you move up. Those are, those are amazing changes for a system that has been, there's been inertia. Uh, and, and what bothers me when I read the newspaper, which most of us get our information from, is the system gets attacked for not doing it sooner. How about we don't look, up, look at that? How about we deal with where we are today and where we're going, okay? The other issue that is, that is fast, is on fast track for us is growth in South Lake County. I proposed um, at the last workshop that we send a letter to the county commission that we ask for full impact fee for South Lake County for growth. Now, will that happen? It's never happened. So I also ask the wording to be added for an alternative to fully fund growth. Those are the key words. Is, is if you're not going to grant the cost that it really cost us, and, and let's talk about that. At the height of our growth in 2006, at most they received 9,400. They needed 14,000 for a single family time. We, we, in this room, accumulated $600 million worth of debt. Today, as I speak to you, we owe $395 million. $34 million a year we're paying right now because we didn't think of it. Yeah, that debt goes to 2031, mm -hmm. by the way. We will need two new schools by 2020. So we better have a plan in place or I have not served you. I will say that. Recently, we went through, and y'all may have read it in the paper, where they came up with a $993 million capital needs. Also, that's refurbishing. I asked that the school district apply a, um, a standard which is uh, um, which would be sustainability on schools. So if you have a school with 200 kids, it's not sustainable. The model for schools is eight months <coughs> minimum, minimum. So the days of the small schoolhouse in public education are going to be gone, I'm telling you. Based on that model, they came back $770,000. So we dropped $200,000. I'm sorry, we dropped $200 million right off the bat. So it was $773 million instead of $993 million. Then I said, now apply a pay as you go. So with the one cent that we're talking about right now, the one third, with fully funding growth in Southland, we can pay for all of our capital needs and have $19 million in the bank by 2031. That's the way we need to be thinking, you see, because the the staff was floating the idea of a geo bond mm -hmm. that, again, more debt for us. Mm -hmm. So there is a change in culture, I'm telling you. It has been slow in coming, but I've been proud to be part of it for the last two years. That's, that's the reason I'm running again. Is, and this is one of the campaign, I guess. <laughs> but, but there needs to be a force of business sense behind it. There's enough warm fuzzy. Don't misunderstand. It's all about the kids, but it's also a huge business. And that's what we have to focus, and we have to make sure that we're proven with our dollars. So, so that's my sort of where I am right now. Now I'm going to go to my. And the toughest decision that's going to come up for me is going to be this coming Monday. It is on the agenda to call for a superintendent search. And I want to explain I'm a swing vote on this, by the way. Um, when I came on, I did not ever speak to the superintendent when I was running for office because I didn't hear anything positive about her. So I didn't want to be jaded about that. Um, in my business, which I started 32 years ago, when I shake someone's hand, I get a sense about them. And I have been very successful. When I met the superintendent and we sat for an hour at the first meeting, she is an honest person. I feel very good about her spirit and her character. We go a year and I have to do my first evaluation. And when you speak about children and you speak about curriculum, her eyes light up. When you speak about operation, she goes dull. That's okay because I love designing restaurants 
and I have a whole team that does the work behind it. But they're good people. She doesn't have good backup, and we spoke about that. And in my evaluation, I spoke about what I just told you all, but also about her staff. And ultimately, the school board, the only person accountable is the superintendent, you see. And so in this past year, we had a, a um, district-level staff person bring a contract to us for use of sites that what? I call $850,000 million, $850, that we were going to be overcharged for taxpayers. And the superintendent said to me, what would you do? I said, I would fire them. And she did. Now, in her, she has more class than that. She just didn't redo their contract. <laughs> because you'll never see her. She's very quiet, and she never will embarrass the board. And that speaks to her character. So when I said to her, her chief operating officer um, is weak. When we came back with our maintenance audit, we were going to save $1 million this year in maintenance. This could be over three years, $1 million in three years. She demoted him last week. Hmm. Her chief, her assistant superintendent, Aurelia Cole, which I got to tell you, over two years was my go-to to solve problems. She's retiring. Oh, really? And so the superintendent has to make a choice of that key position. She has to make a choice of her chief operating officer. And for me, that was the time that I would evaluate in November. Her contract's up next year. So in November would have been the time when we do our evaluations for those key spots to be evaluated and for me then to make a decision whether we go for superintendent search. Not next Monday. That's where I'm at. So I will not be voting for that search. Um, and I hope that the scuttlebutt hasn't hurt our recruiting opportunities um, for the positions now. And then the most important hire that she made a fellow by the name of Hugh Hanabaugh was our uh, curriculum developer. I thought that one out was the most critical. And um, he left. She's hired a David Christ Dr. David Christensen. The guy is sharp, I am telling you. He, at the very first meeting he attended with us, he spoke about that foundation. That's BBK third grade. And his money and attention and a plan for these young men and women was brilliant. We've got to give him the road in order for him to exercise that. So that's kind of where I'm at, and, and um, that's all i got to say. <laughs> and that's the end of the presentation, unless there's any questions. <laughs> yes, sir. I just have a comment that unfortunately is very positive. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, thank, you, thank you for sharing your strategy, because oftentimes you hear from decisions Can you stand up so we can hear? I'm sorry. I, I appreciate that you're hearing Bill's strategy of how it come, came about to make his decision. Because you so often hear somebody make a, a decision and say, well, how in the world did they ever come up with that? Thank you, Bill. Appreciate that. The insight is provided. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Bill, could you elaborate on what you mean by fully funding growth? <laughs> Within the history of impact fees, if we're going to need, right now, we're going to need, by 2020, we will have used up the excess student stations. We're going to need two elementary schools and one high school. That's 30, 30, and 60. So that's where you're going to be. It's 30,000 per elementary and about 60,000 for a high school. In millions? In millions, yes. Okay. So, so I, I, you know, right after I was on the board and recognized, we had a Henderson and Young study that said by 2000, that was done in 2011, and it said by 2025 we would need those schools. Already we were ahead of the curve. And so I was sitting back, and I, I've been fortunate that if you ever go to the villages, uh, I met the Morris family. They came to town a year after I did, and every restaurant up there I've done. So if you want to go, if you want to talk to someone who's been successful,
successful with a development? How did he fund it? And he said to me, Mr. Lawrence, Gary Lawrence said, let me get you in touch with a Dr. Hank Fishkind. Hank, Dr. Fishkind is a world-class economist. He charges $30,000 per speaking engagement. And he came, and he didn't come, I think his associate, Stan Gerberlo, came and spoke to the county commission about how to fund schools without impact fees. And it was at MSBUs. It's Municipal Service Benefit Units. Which means that if you live in one of these big developments that's planned for South Lake, within that development, they would pay for the infrastructure, the schools. It could be used for roads, but I was really talking about schools. And what happens is instead of, this is the unfairness of an impact fee. If you move in to a new home and you pay $10,292, which is what I proposed, and you sell in a year, and the person buying your house has six kids, they pay no impact fee. The MSBU stays with the property, so it is a tax, but it stays with the property over the course of the mortgage, but it sunsets. It ends when it's paid off. That's equitable, and you fully fund it. That's what that's about. The other is, the other option is, is what we call construction lease tax. I propose that. And, and by the way, the county commission, their attorney said we couldn't do it, our attorney said we could do it, and it evaporated. That's what happened. The other proposal that I made was that we do construction lease backs. We don't own the building. Let the contractors in these mega developments, let them build the building. We lease it back. We pay for it with our FTEs. At the end of its life cycle, we don't have a dead asset like Dabney, like the adult. It reverts back to the contractor. That kind of makes sense. The last option, and I've had two meetings about this, is um, that we would have charter schools. And a charter school would build their own. The downside of charter is, is there are good ones and bad ones, and there is nothing in between. I'm telling you folks, it's terrible. So we have to be very careful about selecting who that is. They can build because they're not bound by the same standards as we are. They can build cheaper. And, um, and there's interest on the part of two charters. What I'm pledging to all of you is as long as I'm on the board, we will not go in debt again. That's what I'm saying. And with public uh, pressure, we need to bring the county commission to the table. Mr. Connors, the board chair, said he will not meet with the school board until after the election. Um, that's not acceptable. You know what I mean? It's not acceptable. We have to do work. Right now, I have a borrowed seat that y'all are paying me for that I need to be doing my job right now, not worried about an election. So we need to come up with a plan. And that's the push. That was the reason why I pushed the, the 10 292 was to try and get this off center and get a discussion going. So does that kind of answer? Yes. All right. Yes, ma'am. This is not understanding. I talk loud, but like <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, personnel. I just read the article in the paper the other day about the principal being moved from South Lake. I can see you. <laughs> lost Lake. Okay, you lost Lake well down wherever. Um, could you elaborate I'll, on I'll that? I'll be very proud of that. To speak about that. Pardon? I'll be proud to speak about that. Uh, Rhonda Hunt was the principal at Lost Lake. And here's what happens. There is some state requirements if a school drops to an F school. Right now we're looking at Leesburg. It, the numbers aren't out yet, but the superintendent has a feel for it. Leesburg Elementary, Beverly Shores, and Eustis Heights. Those three potentially would be an F. That means right off the bat, that means a change in leadership. There's no if, ands, or buts about that. So the superintendent, and, and there's a criteria of who that administrator can be coming in. They have to be from a high achieving school, so many years of experience, and Mrs. Hunt fit, fit that bill. Mrs. Hunt, um, and I'm just gonna tell you a long story. <laughs> so Mrs. Hunt comes in, the superintendent says, I need for you to go to the school use of heights. And she says yes. She goes, I don't want to go, but I'm a team player and I will go. Four days later, she calls and says, I'm not going. And I've got two years to retire and I'm staying here. And she started a lobby member. Now, a school board, we have no authority over staff. Unless there's really good cause, we have to go on the superintendent. I told y'all a minute ago, superintendent works for us, that's it. 
she does her staff, and without good cause, we can't object. But Mrs. Hunt felt inclined to get parents to call and emails to come in, and here's how Bill Mathias feels about it. I had a company called Furniture One. I sold it last year. Had and it employed 65 people, and I had an issue with my management company, and I fired him. I brought two of my best from Leesburg down there, and they were there almost a year. Had they go, had they started calling my customers up here saying we don't want to leave, I would have fired them. I told Mrs. Hunt. She she cornered me at the rotunda and told me what I was going to do. And I said, Mrs. Hunt, what I would do, if I could, would be to fire you. That's what I would do. And, and I stand by that. There's conversations about the fact that she had two years left. She should have been allowed to retire at her school. When you're paying someone $115,000, you kind of go where you need to go. She was already on the drop, by the way. She had already <laughs> retired. So she was double dipping. <laughs> That's the rest of the story. I have no patience with that discussion, I mean, to be honest with you. So, um, that's... That's, thank you. That, that clears it. You know, you just thank you. You uh, read what's in the paper and you feel kind of bad for somebody and you think it's that fair. I wanted to hold the story. Thank you. Thank you. It's too bad you can't get it in the paper line. They won't report it. You can get it on a video. <laughs> Bill, I just have a question about when we build these new schools, is there a way to control the costs? And I, I just an example. I took a trip to, to Lake Nona last weekend, the Veterans Hospital. You have this beautiful drive in, all this landscaping. The, the building is gorgeous, and I'm thinking, all this money that they spent on this stuff, they could be helping veterans. Now, why is there a way to, to keep us from going crazy? I mean, I'm an interior designer. I love these things, but uh, you know, there's a there's a place for it. There, there's your school board has again when you look at sustainability, which is what that what that count needs to look like, and you have elementary schools and you build middle schools. The new school of the future is a K or a BPK to eight. Combining the two. Enormous savings. So that standard, and there's a standard design now okay. already at the district level. Um, when you look at our schools, and, and I've traveled to all of them right after I was elected, and some of them are really, really nice. <laughs> I mean, they're really nice. But there are some other things that you think are overspent but are really smart. Like if you notice the schools that were built are brick. Expensive on the front end, but way cheaper on the oh, yeah. side. You know, so About so that's yeah. right for upkeep. Yeah. Because at the end of the of the warranty with the contractor, then you've got um, those issues. So um, there's already that model. That's been done. I feel good about that. Yes, Mr. Uh, when Larry Metz was on the board, one of the things they did was that they when they had the low ra lower ranking schools and the rankings came out, they bring in the principals for those lower ranking schools and grill them and have them make a presentation on why that happened and what they're going to do to fix it. And then what happened is, as you know, I use the term FUD management, is once Larry left, FUD, that whole process dropped and I have not seen it since. And my view is that it, it, in the corporate world I was in, if you have a plant that is, is behind their numbers three years and three months in a row, you start having daily con phone conversations with them to find out why. And I was the guy in corporations that was sent out to troubleshoot why they were screwing up. Uh, or, and not necessarily they were screwing up, it could be the economy or something and they didn't know how to analyze it. And so, but that's all stopped. So what we see is every meeting you have, it's engage LCS, we got a new update, and uh, they're talking about the Bill Gates grant, but they don't ever bring in those guys from those low-ranking schools and put their feet to the fire. And, uh, I, and I know they work for the, the, the superintendent, but I can't understand because the old saying is, what gets watched gets done. 
And if they're not held accountable, uh, and you've seen a pattern where the superintendent does not seem to hold those people accountable, then they need to have their feet on the fire by bringing them in one every meeting and talking about it and a follow-up by now you've got a competent auditor to do a follow-up and find out if their plan worked or not. <coughs> Following up with that, that may have been the only meeting you ever missed, but that was discussed at workshop. Right. I think. And I suggest that these low-performing schools, and, and I think a C is a low-performing, by the way. Mm -hmm. can, can you imagine on this planet that, that and I'm going to give you a quick, not to bog down numbers, because I think I did that earlier with all the millions I was talking about, but 40% of our third graders are at their grade level reading. Yeah. Can you imagine that? 40%. So, if you you're not, that's, Lake County, County. that's Lake County. If you can't build, if you're not up to proficiency third at grade. third grade, what does that begin to look like as we move forward? Mm -hmm. It only gets harder. Yeah. And that's where, and Dr. Christensen, by the way, did all that research and came back with that's where we need to drill down with the dollars and get the extra help in the one-on-one. -on -one. So to his credit. And so his goal is to he set out specific goals. But I said, I said C schools, by the way, should be coming in to speak to us. And the, and the pushback was, um, the board didn't go along with it, let me just say it. I don't want to talk about the pushback. But they didn't want to take these principals out of the schools to come in and come before the board. So that one didn't go very far. Yes, sir. The 30, 40 percent for third grade an average. That was the average. Or just Lake County? That's just Lake County. Okay. That's what Lake is the, the national average? I can't speak to that. I don't Any know. idea? Yes, sir. Ballpark? No. Yes, ma'am. Why did one of the board members uh, oppose having the principals come It was come about in. the time of taking them out of their schools and having them drive to the district. Let me just say this. Yeah. This, one, <laughs> this one I do know, and, and this is a today Florida standard, uh, statistic. 40% of our college students have to take remedial math and English right now. And what's, what does the state of Florida do? If you go to a junior college, you're exempt from taking the remedial math. Yeah. Oh, really? They yes. just did that, that this year. August, that was August of last year. Yes, sir. Um, yeah. Time's Taking up. off of Vance's comment about the manufacturing facility that is underperforming, you know, part of the problem here that is, is, I view it, the elephant in the room that nobody wants to tell has peanuts on their breath is the fact that the raw materials coming into the manufacturing plant um, are poorly prepared for the manufacturing process. And if the raw materials were just that, you know, raw materials, <coughs> they'd be sent back to the supplier saying, uh, these yeah. don't meet our criteria. And that, that is the, uh, the issue. You know, I, I've seen that with the companions that my kids go to school with, my ex-wife's a school teacher. I've been in the classrooms and I've seen it. Uh, the problem is the raw materials. People spend more time, parents particularly, it's their responsibility to prepare their kids. It's their responsibility to continue the education process while they're in the care of the school system. And they spend more time working on their drop step on the hardwood floor or how to run a pass pattern and catch a ball on the, on the football gridiron than they do on the basics in the educational process. And you combine that with the substantial behavioral problems that you have. I've heard the anecdotal stories from teachers who cannot speak publicly because they get no support from the administrative staff on the discipline <laughs> issues in their classrooms. And sure, they have this nice little written policy, uh, but if you, you actually try and send a child for discipline, uh, then you're looked uh, down upon by the administrative staff and given a hard time. And you know, you're just supposed to you know, deal with it because everybody's having to deal with these same disciplinary problems. Be creative. And the fact of the matter is, if you have an ill-prepared child, the bad raw material, who gets 
you know, socially promoted up because you don't have a grading process that forces them to stay back in the grade because they didn't make it and they just happen to edge by on the skin of their teeth you know, on some grading uh, uh, test that they took. And you don't discipline them, you've removed all the disciplinary tools from the teachers and the administrators. Uh, guess what? You're going to get 40% are competent with their age group because that's probably the amount of parents that actually read the newspaper and provide any semblance of some type of educational influence in their homes. And that, that's the problem. And why the school board, you know, one out of 67 school boards in the state of Florida has got to get up because I guarantee you there are 5,000 counties in the United States that have the same problem. And that's, that's that raw materials are, are, are clogging up our system. Stop blaming the educational teachers for the problem. They're, they have their own contributions to it, but they're not the same, you know, the whole problem. Was there a question Was there a question there? <laughs> uh, let me, let me, let me, what do you think of that? <laughs> let me hit on just a couple points. Uh, you, you, Mark, you, you were spot on about, again, in the, in the data that was presented to us, that those students that do the BPK, which is pre-kindergarten, mark increase in their ability to be on grade versus those that just enter kindergarten. So, again, the focus has to be to get those students into these um, pre-K programs because they're not getting what they need at home. The, well, we're blessed in Lake County, and we're, when you speak about resources, is that we have an amazing pool that hasn't been drawn on, which is retired educators and business people, and to bring those in. The issue is that children aren't being reinforced at home, and that is a social issue because if you look at what Lake County used to be, it used to be agricultural, but there's a, there's a generation where People just didn't go beyond the eighth grade because they went work in the orchards, and so there's no. And if the parent doesn't feel empowered by education, he's not going to pass that on to his children. So we've got to change that that uh, culture, and it's not that's not an easy task. Though. And but we have we have the resources in Lake County to do it if we're committed to it. Um, I had proposed as I drove around, as I first campaign two years ago. I came back with the realization that it's almost like a two-step back. We have to reach the parents first. I met with Black Ministry Alliance in Eustis. We were going to have GED programs in the schools on Wednesdays. But that got lost over a gay club thing or a this or that. I, mean, I get distracted with little stuff and don't stay on message. That resource and that commitment is still there. At that time, if you remember, there was a fellow by the name of Sandy Carpenter that went for sheriff. And he had a guy by the name of Shaquille O'Neal that was all through the town. And he met with the Black Ministry Alliance and said, if you will get the black vote out for Sandy Carpenter, we will build three gymnasiums around the county. And in unison, they told him, what we want is learning centers. We don't want kids on the corner playing basketball. So, so the spirit is there within our community. We just need to, have to grab onto it. And, and there needs to be leadership to finish that process. But I think we've got to reach the parents I spoke to a fellow, he, he runs a hedge fund, and he came to Lake County, and he had between two and eight million dollars to invest in various businesses. But he was concerned about our workforce. When I spoke to him about, he lives by the fact of South, um, right on the Orange County line. And the more we talked, he said to me, what if I invested money to start feeding kids? He's, he's um, not Christian, but anyway, he's a good leader. He wasn't very interested in my church. I'd be young, so. <laughs> But he was interested in what if we did in elementary schools. So what if our schools could feed kids a dinner and then also offer GEDs or open them up at night? Well, that would be amazing to me. And actually, I like that idea even better, quite honestly. Um, yes, ma'am. I think um, I went to Bates Avenue Neighborhood Council in Houston, and we did get the middle school, the Kurt Wright Center, mm -hmm. opened up at night. That's right, because y'all were on this way. There's another program in um, Leesburg, uh, Pastor Ken Scrubs runs it called Genesis Center. Yeah, uh, oh yeah. And it, it is amazing success. Yeah, it does a great job. So you see the, the, <coughs> the talent, it's all about just bringing it all together. But it's all about, you're not wrong, Mark, when we speak about the raw material, that we, we've got to have um, a way to develop that material. It's coming no matter what. Yeah. And the other thing that's happened with our 
our school system from, again, the outside world, is there's a flight away from public education. And so where you have homeschool as a real option, and it has become very cohesive in how it works, you have private schools, and those are cutting off sort of the cream, if you will, or those parents that are really involved, which is always what way the school work. Now you're left um, with a hodgepodge that isn't what it could have been had it all been public. Now, I haven't been an advocate of fair choice, so I'm okay with that. Yes, ma'am. I certainly agree with his analogy about the raw material. I taught for 24 years here, and, you know, I've seen it all, seen it change, and I agree, too, that the parents certainly are not doing their bit. But I do, I would like to have seen the school board, the superintendent, set some more stronger guidelines, rules for discipline, and to back them up. I thought uniforms would have been great. Not everybody thought that evidently, but something that would give, that just kept them from running wild and being more interested in what they were wearing and who they were seeing and get back to the basics. But we needed, uh, teachers didn't feel they were being backed up by principals because principals had to answer to the superintendent or the board or whoever, and it was like nobody, I, I saw it happening where I heard teachers say, I'm not going to do anything, nobody's going to back me up. You know, it just, it was sad that it got <coughs> where we are. But, well, I've got to tell you that on almost a daily basis, I hear about teachers being concerned about reprisal. Yeah. I hear from administrators, and I'm not exactly sure where that culture started or how you end it, because I don't get a sense about that at, with Dr. Moxley, for example, and she's the, the head of the fish, so it spells down. But, but if it exists, then it must be real, you know? And um, there was a comment made when I first was elected, which I don't allow to use anymore, which was, we serve at the will of the board. Meaning, if, if I say I want something done, they're going to make it happen. Now, if they know I'm completely wrong, they're still going to make it happen. And that happened during this, when we had to get the courtesy busing. And that frosted me. So, at a workshop, I said, how about if you tell me the truth? If we weren't ready to end courtesy busing, you should have said that to me, not will of the board. And it went from there to, without even getting without missing a step, the superintendent goes, well, we need for the school board to set our agenda, what we need to be doing. I just said, you folks are working it every day. Just so you know, I sell pots and pans for a living. You know, Rose hands over to the community. You know, each one of us has a job. We're there to be a board and a policymaker. Set the agenda for us. Let us look at that and support you in it. And the superintendent looked at me like I had two hands, but she didn't got it. So now that there's a change of culture, they're bringing things to us. We're having a discipline civil discourse about policy. That's what a business should do, and that ultimately will change the culture of the board, where teachers should be empowered to speak up. When we had the class size um, issue, <coughs> I guess I should have spoken about that for half a second, because I should have been about that. <laughs> you could not, that was a situation where. Can you give an overview of it for those that don't know? Okay, here, here's what happened. At many old high school, my school, we had a teacher who was asked to sign a document that was not truthful. And um, there was some hint there may have been some reprisal if she did it. And she, she reported that to the Department of Education, and it started an investigation. Now, as it so happened, the two students that she was reporting, actually the behind the scenes documentation was correct. And there was no breach of the class size of them. Set that aside for a second. During all the scuttlebutt and emails to me and counsel from me to the superintendent, and I'm sure other board members, that it was bigger than that picture. It was bigger than that one person. And I felt like that it was at least six schools. And as it kept blossoming, it could have been as many as 15 that we had violations of class size. I'm 
to stop there and now tell you the ultimate thought is. 32 years of business, I started with $5,000. If I can beat the government all day long, if it is gray, I take the deduction. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> In this case, those administrators had zero to gain by doing it. But since 2002, we had never not met class size. So there was no personal gain to them. But it would mean, if you reported it, that you would have to pay a fine back to Tallahassee, which is about, at one time, it was about $3,000. Now it's about $1,500 a kid. So in their mind, 67 percent we're not getting our just, we're not getting our just due anyway. So if we fudge a number, so be it. Had it ended there, it would have been like okay with me. The problem is, is that when I ask you to be part of it, if I could fudge the numbers as an administrator, if I make you lie, now you cross the line. That's where I'm in a little bit. And so that's kind of how it's sorted out. So now then, without, here was our choices. We could spend up to $165,000 and investigate every, talk to every teacher, talk to every administrator. We could put people and we could chop their heads off at the state. Or we could say, we're going to spend $20,000, which the superintendent did, she was within her purview, and we're going to find out what the procedure was for her, and let's fix the procedure. That, quite honestly, is what I bought into, and I support it. So, the superintendent at her press conference took responsibility for it. We will never know. Here's what, here's what I was told by administrators. In my case, I had um, um, Mrs. Shepard, who's the principal at Manila High School, High achieving principal, by the way, high achieving, that she came to administration, not the superintendent, and said, I am over on these people. I had 15, 16, whatever it was. She was told, go back and make it work. Okay? So when I called the person that told her that, they're all public servants, it was Lori Marshall, and she's under the superintendent. I called Lori Marshall and said, Lori, did you ever follow up and see how she made it work? So it was almost like, it's okay, you know what I mean? Like I said, make it work, and they never came back. Now as a board member, here's the impact of Bill Matthias. I would rather them pay the fine, because when we make allocations for teachers and space, we're basing it on cooked books, mm -hmm. you see? Yeah. So we weren't getting the right numbers. So our allocations, and you almost wonder why we're always short on our allocations, it's because they never were right. So is, is that kind of a picture of it? So I wasn't inclined uh, as some other board members were, to fire or make some big show of it. I was more inclined to get it fixed and let's move forward, which is what we did. Yes, sir. Bill, I understand that one of the fixes uh, is to hire someone that's full, 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 full time assignment is to make sure this doesn't happen again by overseeing it at, at, a, at a very nice salary. This is, that seems so inappropriate to me. Let me stop you there, because this was an amazing story. <laughs> I was out of the country when they took the vote. <laughs> this is pretty good. Nice trick. Yeah, yeah. So, so I wouldn't have spoken about it. If I'm not here to vote, I'm not going to speak about what I would have, should have, could have done. But it went through. And I was so pissed off when I got back, just to be quite honest, because I'd already <laughs> told the superintendent privately I did not, I did not support it. I won't vote, just so you all know, I won't vote for one more administrative position cutting teachers, and we're cutting our school workers. I will not do that. Whether it's needed or not, by the way. And, and it was it was sold that this person could actually make us money. Like in sales, you have to spend some money to make some money. So anyway, so it went through, and I, and, and, um, I looked at the agenda when I could get an internet connection, and I saw it was on there, I was going, God damn it. Well, I got back, and I'm not saying that they did anything. The superintendent, I got back, she and I talked. Apparently it had to be on there so they could hire and before the school year started. But what they didn't do is they didn't have the job description with the job. So I'm back at the board meeting now. Now I'm back. And the job description comes before the board. And I voted against the job description, <laughs> which effectively killed the position. Because that was a 3-2 vote. It went 3-2 three, three to two 
I guess the job description. If you don't have a description, you can't hire the position. So that went away. So it, 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 that did not get filled. If nothing is done like about a search <laughs> for a new superintendent next Monday, yes, ma'am. Then when would be the next time that it could come up? Could it come up again after you get the information you were? Here, here was the here was already in place how it was going to sort out. The superintendent's contract, I told you, was up next June. In November, every November, we do our evaluation. Okay. If her evaluation is at a certain, I don't even know what the number is, but if it's a bad evaluation, that automatically triggers a search. Automatically. The state of Florida requires it. Mm -hmm. And that would have told the tale in that orderly process. So, and her evaluation, if it's public records, and mine's online, if you go there, any critique I had was about her staff, not about her. I'm telling you. So those hires were critically are still critically important for my decision. Okay. Yeah. But it should be after the election. And in, and again, in August or November, it could be a whole new board, by the way. There's no guarantee. Mine's a borrowed seat. There's no guarantee that I will be there. And I would rather have the choice of who I'm going to be working with the next four years that I'm making that choice, not not someone that's up for election. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, that's just how I feel about it. All right, Bill. All right, thanks so much. Thank you.